This here, so here we are saying no flat, uh, and one millimeter and 75th centile. Now this is mean CIMT, by the way, and then suddenly we say less than 50% stenotic flat. Now less than 50% stenotic flat for It's a huge people, jump. It's a huge jump. Right, so there are a lot of people with 5%, 10%, 15%, Correct. and, and uh, Henrik's data shows those are actually 50, 60% of the population. Right. Population. And similarly, greater than 50% here is That's really very greater. low, like 5% of right. the population. That's a good point. Very good point. And then, you know, this okay. greater than 50% is really now we are dealing into an area of almost treatment, surgical or stem treatment. That's low and this treatment. is equal to like a thousand of CAN. I know? think so. Really I think you just bring in a very good point. The way we box them, these here, it looks like they're equally distributed in the population, right. whereas this. And this is like 90% of the population, 95, and now it's only 5% of right. the population. Correct. So we may need to break it down further here. And but how do you do that? What's the criteria in terms of? Well, you know what? We could probably here distinguish the uh, the flat burden between this and this. Mm -hmm. You know, and here we could just talk talk about you know stenotic flat, yeah. anything above I don't know 10, 20 percent, but not not this high. But the very high risk, I think, was pur purposely designed to go to a level beyond systemic therapy, and that's local therapy and focal therapy. And that's where you go identify ischemia and whatever the area of ischemia is that you So I think we need to stay somewhere close to that guidelines that are out there, because otherwise it would be very hard for us to come up with a guideline that would tra trigger an interventional study, and that's not accepted by the no, so let me let me ask you this, Matt, and and then what percentage of people who have let's say a CAC of greater than 100, let's say 200, uh, who actually have disease on coronary angiography? Because he, we are assuming, you know, so, so I don't think these two are equivalent. I think this 50% stenotic is very high. So you're saying CAC less than? No, no, no. no. We, are, we are just saying greater than 100 and greater than 90. Right, no, st obviously 50% stenotic plaque is the wrong. That's yeah, your parotid, but for very calcium, I think that's the right criteria. I know, but, but we don't know. They're not equivalent, is what she's saying. Oh, that's they're not equivalent. Right. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, there are a lot more people with this than this. Correct. Okay. Okay. Anyway, right. I, think, I think this one actually applies to 75-year-olds. If you started screening 75-year-olds and higher, then I think this would apply. <laughs> Uh, and I personally am in favor of screening 75 year olds simply to prevent neurovascular events. That's right. And as far as the uh, functional imaging is concerned, I think um, if there is enough expertise in the group and interest of pursuing this avenue of heart failure, hypertension, I, I think we should look into it. Well, it's probably, yeah, let me come back to you. To, we can, then do we have to put it on the so, Yeah, the hypertension, I mean, Recommending treatment of a hypertension would be a can of We're not recommending We're not recommending treatment. So, we are trying to prevent heart failure. That's, from that's hypertension. one step back. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we'll put, we're going to put that in the guideline. That we discussed the guide, the, the task force discussed it and came to you know conclusion that we're going to focus on atherosclerotic, but those are important areas in asymptomatic population. Now, I think we left out a huge part, and that's the ankle brachial index that. I muted that, just the person to deal with that. Um, this is my first meeting. Um, my name is Marge Lovell, and I'm chair of the PAD Coalition, and I'm a nurse at the London Health Sciences Centre in Canada. And I think really our focus should be on early prevention, special populations, and that's where I'm going to put my plug in for the PAD and the API. Uh, we've heard all about the, the coronaries and the uh, carotids, but you know what? These patients that we deal with, they're getting younger every day. I'm not so sure we should put an age cap on this. We should look at treat the patient, treat the patient. Each one is an individual, the special population groups, the diabetics, uh, the obesity group, uh, some of the working situations somebody mentioned earlier, and the PAD population. These people are very, very high risk for heart attack and stroke. That's my message is education. Thank you. So, so actually you just added to Robert's special population, the yeah. PAD positive group. Well, well, we have to think about ABI in this whole algorithm. Okay, but the right. No, 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 no. Well, ABI I mean, is a screening test right. for cardiovascular risk. Right, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's a really important piece, though, is absolutely. the uh, aorta as well as is peripheral arterial yeah. disease. Let's, yeah. let's, let's talk about it right here. You know, step one, why not do PAD right there too? 
That's where I was hoping to see it. <laughs> I like curb comment. He's <laughs> no, I, good morning. I'm not a singer, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm actually with Marjorie's PAD Coalition. I do agree with what I heard so far as it relates to uh, the checklist of risk factors uh, as well as lifestyle changes. Uh, I actually underwent a lifestyle change myself. I lost 50 pounds uh, recently. Uh, I heard so much about being an African American over the age of 50. And I saw myself being a professional, putting on more and more weight, so I actually changed my lifestyle and I'm in that lower risk group now. But uh, I agree with the changes as it relates to lower and moderate as it relates to the uh, language here. And um, as well as moving the uh, ABI up further up at the top. Um, another question I heard someone say earlier about the retest interval with the five and 10 years. Uh, I would be seriously look at it too if you had a person in what you would call the moderate risk group that had family history or history of risk factors, that interval may be too long where you miss some disease process with that individual depending on their lifestyle, firefighter, or whatever I heard earlier. So those are some things that I think would also help to uh, bring about a positive change. Great. So if we, uh, PK maybe start from you, if we add as shape two, PAD screening here as well. We know the PAD positive people are much, much smaller than the... Uh, no, it's different. No, no. So the ACC measurement of ABI is reasonable to assess cardiovascular risk in asymptomatic adults. It, right? It is not PAD. The word PAD is not in there. It has nothing no, to do with PAD. No, no, ABI. 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 So don't confuse no, no, the terms I, at all. Okay, well, yeah. correct, correct. I believe that ABI. we should have a third thing or ankle brachial index ABI here. as the atherosclerotic well, test. Not, not or. I think that or. should be at. I think that no. should be at. No, because if PAD be the only screening device, it's, it's not PAD. So, I mean, uh, ABI being the only screening device is going to leave out a ton of people because mm -hmm. ABI is. Is you really have a word that you're talking about a positive or, test. Or, I'm oh, sorry, Matt. Matt, positive Matt, test. Matt, can you use pointer? I, I can't sure. see where you're Well, I'm just saying here, right? There's an or. That word, or. That should be in. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, if you're going to have or there, you can't put it in. I'm sorry, go ahead. Right? I mean, where would you add it? No, Matt, the, okay, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to come back here. Here, if you say or, I would only open an ABI screening <coughs> clinic and I'll call it shape compatible clinic. And that's it. We do nothing. No coronary calcium, no empty because if you said or. But it's I think we're there. No, no, that was at that time. We're gonna talk about it again. back to this when PK started saying he would do IMT first and then coronary calcium. We're gonna talk about that too. But let's talk about adding it there first. I think you are saying ABI should be added there. Am I reading you? Yeah, no, ABI should be added, but I don't think you want to make it an and, and then you have to do three tests. And be done okay. all three. Let's now you can't do all three. Let's agree that we want ABI there. Now let's discuss what I'm not sure from you because you brought this one first. If you doing fraud IMT and you find high risk, then you don't even go to the next uh, CAC because you got the high risk patient with plaque. Why do you want to learn from coronary calcium? Maybe I, I think because of concern about radiation and costs and so forth, I think uh, we got some criticism of our original recommendations. So a reasonable approach might be to start with a carotid ultrasound. And if you have an abnormal carotid ultrasound, you have identified subclinical atherosclerosis. And you don't necessarily have to do a coronary calcium scan as well. You could stop there. But if you have a normal carotid, it doesn't exclude coronary atherosclerosis. And then you go and do the coronary calcium scan. Okay, so that's, so that's kind of a practical, that's usable good. strategy. It's it's one, one approach. Right, but, but how about the opposite? So if you have a positive calcium score, I'm not going to do a carotid IMT. Exactly. Right, that's so that's why the that's it stays as or. If any of them are positive, you stop. Exactly. Right. I really. If your ABI is positive. Right. I would argue strongly that we should not tell the doctor specifically which test to have to start because it's local expertise, right, and everything else. We agree. We agree. Tell us what you found in this very relevant study. Yeah. 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 Ye
You know, we did in our Heinz of Record study uh, these three things that we looked for different territories, corneal calcium, IMT, and the uh, uh, ABI index. And it is very important to notice that the prevalence of pathological ABI is low. You see 4.7% and we cannot just compare it to calcium where we have 82%. In male, and you see IMD more than 75 percent. That was 25 percent, roughly. That was for male, and here you see the data for female. Uh, the prevalence of uh, positive ABI was again 4.5, IMD 25 percent, and uh, calcium less than 55 percent of the patients. Of the I think the guidelines actually say that you have to target it to individuals who are greater than 70 or greater than 55 or 60 or more than the risk factor. That's actually so that you avoid this problem of yeah. low prevalence yes, in the general population. And what Max just said is very make it easier. So you start with any of these. If you're positive, you found the higher risk. If you're negative, go to the next part. You well, have a, okay. Another way to look at it is that. Since very, very few people are going to have a positive PAD with a zero calcium score or a normal um, IMT, that if you do those tests, you don't need to, you don't need to do uh, ABI. But if they're po very positive as a service to the patient, if they're old enough, you might well, have I would, I would argue, I would, I would argue against it because in the case of PAD, very severe PAD, we do have local therapy. And that is, the treatment is not just the statin treatment. Right. So if you don't do it, those populations who can benefit from local therapy, according to existing guidelines, will not get the benefit of the local therapy. So it doesn't But, but there's no evidence at all that treating their symptoms improves their outcome. But, but the guidelines say you do treat them. That's why you're doing interventional. No, no, no. Treat them medically. Like all right, right. right. We're not getting into how to treat as far as intervention versus medicine. No, no, no. What I'm saying is if you have identified the high risk patient, CBD high risk patient, natural squatting patient, high risk patient, by IMG chloric calcium, IMG chloric calcium, you know, there's a group of subgroup of people who could benefit from local therapy in the IMG, meaning carotid. Uh, as well as the femoral bed. We don't have that for coronary. No, there are a very small population that you could do intervene. We don't have that. But asymptomatic, 90% carotid stenosis right. is recommended for immediate local therapy. Asymptomatic, which is not really asymptomatic, but symptomatic PAD, ABI less than six, is recommended for local therapy. No, right? I don't think that's the recommendation. I, I think that not for asymptomatic decrease in ABI, you don't have to Okay, so we should, we, sh uh, we should then, we should really very clearly clarify the, P the ABI screening that is not applicable to those who have symptoms, because if they have symptoms, they have to yeah, go under no and this is for okay, asymptomatic. I think we've got a very clear picture. Uh, you have a few comments, I think we glossed over uh, Matt, don't go. <laughs> uh, we, we had two very distinct comments there. PK says we should use IMT as the first test. Matt says we shouldn't tell people which test to use first. I think this is a very important... I, I, I didn't give my said that's what I prefer. But I think this is a very important issue that we need to deal with. We should leave it to availability, yeah. right? But, Availability, but we're also talking about a lot of cost effectiveness, radiation That's issues. Radiation. So I, I think that we need, I'm not saying which way we should go, but I think it's a topic I that think we need to talk a about. Point. Now we come to a real political acceptance of our group. We've been criticized many times because of radiation. And that huge jam of paper and, and so on. Now, PK, you were the first to start IMT first. Would you be comfortable to say IMT first? And if you find IMT high risk, then you don't need to be in the But screening for that purpose, I think if you find one major vascular bed that's abnormal, you just basically identify it. I mean, who in this room would not treat a patient with a carotid plant and a zero partner in house? Who would not treat that patient? Yeah, what's your threshold for the IMT, or do you not use IMT? I think I predominantly, so far, have been using plaque. 
What is the cost of the IMD? What is the cost of the IMD? It's covered by Medicare. That, well, the cost of IMT, it varies by the provider so and cost, but it is. If we, it's we could, 300 or 400 dollars, the cost of the coronary calcium mm -hmm. scan could be 100. No, no, no. Coronary IMT could be as, as definitely lower than coronary calcium if, if we, yes, yes, if it comes to that volume. I think some of these services, when we were in the state of Texas uh, legislative uh, uh, meeting with the insurance committee, there was one company that said they, they are providing it at 75 or 95 dollars. So, uh, there's a service that provides IMT, abdominal ultrasound, yeah. EKG, um, for $100. 100? And that is covered by Medicare. Yeah, I think. Well, no, Medicare doesn't no, cover yeah. it. The state of Texas is the only one who covers it, and, and, and I think. No, no, no. I, I'm sorry. Medicare covers a carotid exam, right. which a subset is the IMT. Right. But they do not cover the asymptomatic people with the carotid IMT. But the symptoms are. T, uh, numbness or tingling? No, no, no. Visual disturbances? Stroke? TIA? Pre existing stroke? Those are all not. Medicare costs him at $99. Medicare costs him at $99. There you go. $99. Okay. okay. And you lower a bit? So calcium, <laughs> that's what it is. That's the national rate for calcium scoring for asymptomatic right. people, for triage tool, yeah. for cholesterol management. That's what we're talking about with Shane. It's $99 for calcium score. That's Matt, the price. Matt, I think the cost issue is really They're not charge more because we live in different yeah, we charge 100 in New York. <laughs> I think what, 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 what I favor PK's approach because of better political acceptance, because radiation is not an issue. There's no way we can do that. There's no way you can say IMT should trump calcium or calcium should trump IMT. No, that should trump. No, that, no, that should come first. You can't say which one should come first. The data is bad. You can't say. We're saying, we're saying, if you find the high risk patient with product, you can't tell them what to do first. You can't. It's a no more. Stop. You can't do it. It's not. It's not on the table. It's not even scientifically valid to do IMT before calcium. Look at look at the Heinz, look at the recall study. It's exactly backwards. So that's recall. Look at it. I think, I think the options are going to be the options are Okay, you won. Yeah. But, but there's the data. We've got to go with science here. We're not going to make our own algorithm based on PK's preference. I agree with him. If he wants to do it that way, no. If PK wants to do it that way, that's great for PK. But we cannot, as an organization, say you have to do IMT first. Okay. Too many okay. I, think, I think we have, we have some, yeah. we have some yeah. confidence here that the cost of Okay. Maybe we could say, I think Matt just left for you. Matt, come on, We're going to have to keep buying an IMT in the <laughs> So, bottom line is if you find a, a significant black case with IMT, right. forget about chronic calcium in this case and aggressively you start your treatment. That's the message. I, 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 I think, um, I, I agree with the ratio that Right. Okay. What percentage of women in age 45 to 50 had cat positive? Do you have that? 
We have that data. It's not a lot. Yeah, well, it is a, a small population. It's a small population. But I think we should look into that. This is a very important point, so please pour your passion and don't fear okay. fighting that. Because he, he, so, some, some general comments. I think a lot of us wear two hats. One of them is uh, the guideline writer, and the other is the doctor taking care of individual patients. And this is what I do day after day. I sit with patients at counseling scores or CTA, and I have totally lost my ability to predict anything when I'm dealing with an individual patient. All bets are off. There is absolutely no rhyme or reason to it. So, the logical extension of that, which is clearly impossible because Matt says, but I agree with you, we can't screen everybody. But I think we have to acknowledge that without a test for subclinical atherosclerosis, we are doing a really lousy job taking care of individual patients. For screening the entire population, it's very different. But I think we do have to acknowledge, and there have been hints of that, although nobody has come out and said it, that any risk factor-based score is essentially worthless and how much we want to depart from Framingham or Reynolds score will raise political issues. But I think we've all believed deep down that they're all worth us and that you really must do this in the test of subclinical atherosclerosis. How to incorporate this without offending too many people and without encouraging people to throw even more stones at us than they did before is going to be the trick. So let's pick up this discussion from 20 to 45 is where the American Heart Association says do only, well, they say cholesterol for the entire life, but cholesterol is screening. They do recommend the screening. They recommend that the screening too is just cholesterol. If SHAPE recommends, thinking loudly, if SHAPE recommends INT is a non-invasive screening, which is not radiation based, it doesn't have all those issues, and INT, not plaque, because they don't have plaque, for this population from 20 to 45, and build a non pharmacologic approach, meaning you find them aggressively non pharmacologic and then transmit it. Testing, what do you think? Again, what do you think? I, I think separating out the younger population a for a, 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 a special a separate flowchart of, of, of shape that is IMT yeah. based makes a lot of sense. And also, this is, this is a very population that might need to be. Retested. And it's slow their progression of disease, so you would have less coronary calcium positive later. Repeating that. Keep your mouth getting criticized for exposure. For exposure to x ray. That's about it. Okay, but more here's the problem. So we got criticized for shape because it incorporated too many people. And that was age 45 men, 55 women. Yeah, so now you're going to change shape two to age 20? Because people are just saying, Go ahead and put them on a statin. Go ahead and put them on another That's not why you're criticized. No, no, you're criticized because we're no science. No, 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 no. The, one of the major criticisms that came to us is that radiation. The second was that it's going to open the, the downstream revenue for hospitals because they're going to take them that to go and do the uh, angiography and then go ahead and do unnecessary, you know, what, what uh, uh, Nis and, and, and the other guy said that you're just going to open this malpractice thing that is already out there. A lot of people getting, you know, sent that for and you're just going to help them. With this approach of taking out the young population and put them in this special category, we won't have that because we're not ever going to tell them to go Why do we have a separate people. paper on yeah. well, shape no. for young? No. Not and that's what I'm shape yeah, yeah. That's, that's A separate that's paper, yeah. new, new group of doctors, and another day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just we have too much work to do no, in the next day and a half. I think, I think what, what Robert brought as a special population is a good category, right. and we just defined it under a special population. So we'll Age 20 to 45 is a special right. population. Well, it's a special population because of the risk. Family history. 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 That's what I do, right? No, what about low HDL? There you go. Oh, come on, that's everything. It's, it's a complex topic. <laughs> and Matt is right. Not to dilute the major effort. It's better to use it as a separate uh, and maybe as a, a shape, shape, as a follow up. Shape it on. Sure. Let's. I would, yeah, my, my proposal would be very simple. Right. Shape 2 should be focused on the middle aged population that have most events. And if you want to get into lifetime risk and 20 year old screening, I'm all for that. But that shouldn't be part of this message, or else they will take that opportunity to bash the whole document. That's a good <laughs> that's 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 that
to actually be shape 2.5, and that's right. the focus that's of the long lifetime risk therapy. It would actually give us opportunity to, to put additional background related to that population. I'm not so sure that's a good idea, though, because what if you have a 39 year old man whose father had no, an MI at age 32? No, 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 I mean, this, we got to draw a line. I, but I, I, I think we can, I think we have to include the family history in younger people in, okay. in this I, document. No, I'm the lines we have to draw right now is a break <laughs> for 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 I'd like to remind the speakers to keep their comments fairly brief and leave ample time for discussion. So we're going to start with Dr. Howard Hodes from USC to give us an update on what's new in vascular ultrasound. Dr. Hodes. So, uh, my name is Howard Hodes, and uh, this is my first time to attend this meeting, and I do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, I really didn't know uh, what to prepare. The guidelines were kind of kind of broad, um, but I think what I put together might be interesting and at least consistent with some of the discussion. He's on the phone. And we can show him your presentation. Is there any way I can have your presentation here and then walk through the slides? Try this. There you go, David. Who right. catches uh, well? He <laughs> says he does. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark here. It's dark. Right. You should have seen it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Don't put up the porno pictures. So I'm going to start somewhat broad, which I'm sure a lot of you already know the data, and bring this down to a more refined level um, with, with uh, some more recent data. So uh, the, the prediction between IMT and cardiovascular events has been known for quite a while. And this data has been looked at in multiple ways by multiple investigators. You can see this is an older publication by our group. And in general, what, what has been found and reported is that, that uh, globally IMT is, is really quite robust. When you look at the studies carefully, these are uh, a hodgepodge of methodologies, um, both in terms of how the IMT was acquired, how it was measured, and even how events themselves were acquired, um, and the durations. Uh, this predictability seems to be uh, robust across um, ethnic groups, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, um, across uh, genetically diverse groups of individuals, very broad age range, 20 to 90, in men and women, both with symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. So here we just did a simple uh, standardization of the one standard deviation increase in IMT, and you can see that the relative risk is anywhere from 10 to uh, 40 percent in terms of prediction. And there's been several studies published after these that are quite consistent. To be fair, there are a few studies out there that report no relationship, either with IMT and even with carotid plaque. So, so even though those are a minority of data, they are out there. So when we look at different segments, this is this is often a 
an argument uh, about IMT that we should be looking at multiple segments and combining lesions. Um, now, when I say lesions, I, should, I really should say plaques. This is not the definition that Dr. Spence will use. But looking across different different segments and combining or not combining, looking at maximal thickness or mean thickness. Really, the bottom line: the best studies are shown here that have looked at these different um, segments and in relation to each other. And as you can see, pretty much they all predict pretty pretty nicely. This obviously has clinical implications because it's very difficult to uh, image the higher you go up into the neck, the more difficult it becomes. And in fact, if you look at the original ARIC paper, who was really the first group that did this in a large scale epidemiologic, 50% uh, of their uh, internal carotid data were missing. And they use really quite sophisticated, fancy um, Monte Carlo type of uh, statistical analyses to input the data. So, if, if the goal is to acquire images reliably and consistently with low variability, then you need to come lower down into the, into the carotid vessel. So what we have also is the ability to look over time and measure change over time in relation to events, and we can find uh, good correlation and significance with, with uh, change in IMT and predicting events. These are, these are high-risk individuals, obviously, uh, who were followed out for about 15, 10, 8 to 10 years, some up to 15 years. And, and these data were standardized at the time. Somebody mentioned this earlier that the populations are changing. And you know, we've been, we've been doing this work um, you know, my mentor, uh, David Blankenhorn, uh, going back as far as him for almost um, 40 years now. And as we look at our data, we see that progression rates, just like event rates, have massively dropped, markedly dropped. And uh, so this is standardized to, a, to what was at the time felt to be the, the uh, normal rate, if you will, of progression, about 0.011. And basically what you see is a threefold increase in rate, predicting about a threefold increase in events. And it's important to discern between uh, heart events, such as MI and coronary death, and all cardiovascular events, because we know that interventions are highly, um, are highly observationally or, or interventionalist uh, driven. But in this case, uh, both do correlate very nicely. So in the IMT world uh, really uh, lag behind the, the CAT world in terms of looking at um, risk beyond Framingham risk score. And uh, really, it was the, the, the CAT groups that started uh, this, this fervor, I guess, is how you can look at it. Um, all the initial studies I showed you were was risk beyond all all other risk within those groups, uh, whether it was Framingham or biomarkers or whatever. So the, the whole concept here was to do uh, somewhat similar things as the CAC world, which was to see if uh, individuals could be recategorized. So this is one of the, the newer studies. Um, 409 asymptomatic individuals. It's a, it's a study out of Spain. They're non-diabetic uh, and they're all hyperlipidemic. So of the, of the 409 individuals, almost 60% based on Framingham were misclassified. Now, um, not to um, open up doors to a lot of other Issues, but you know, Framingham is really is not a score that predicts atherosclerosis. It's a score that predicts events. So a lot of what we see uh, in the disassociation between imaging and Framingham, and these and other other scores, is is really driven by the different endpoints that, that we're um, 
trying to accomplish. But with that limitation, you can see that a large of individuals in this cohort were misclassified. So four out of five had more atherosclerosis than what Framingham predicted. It also underestimated the risk um, that CIMT predicted, and they used a 75% um, cut point and 50% of both intermediate and low risk categories. And this sort of goes back to, to uh, Matt's argument, you know, should we be looking at reclassifying intermediates or, or low risk individuals? Um, these data obviously support both categories as being underestimates. Framingham also appears to overestimate risk. You can see if one out of three individuals had uh, less atherosclerosis than Framingham would predict for events in this population. Then the whole issue of vascular age versus chronological age, which is a really a highly unproven hypothesis. Um, you can see that based on a control group that they used in this study, that they concluded that the uh, estimated vascular age um, was much older than the chronological age in uh, two-thirds of their population. And you can see it was quite diverse, about 50 years versus 63 years. And in 10 years, especially in this age range, that has immense, immense implication for events. So this is another study, uh, also in 2008. There aren't a lot of these studies, by the way. Um, this is probably the bulk of the literature, actually. Uh, you can see that uh, in the low-risk group, Framingham risk score at 10%, that about 25, about a quarter of them, 23%, had uh, subclinical atherosclerosis, again defined as an IMT greater than 75th percentile. So although the overall IMT in this Framingham risk category was about 0.64, uh, when you look at the 75th percentile, 23% of them then had a mean of 0.75, which they would call um, high risk. So again, we see a reclassification of even a, a very low risk group of individuals. This goes to the whole argument, uh, again, about uh, lifetime risk. Um, one, of the, one of the parameters was to show some cardio NASA data. Um, just, as, just as an opinion, um, as, as a, a famous politician once said, we're all entitled to our opinion, we just can't make up our own facts. But just as an opinion, since the last shape guidelines, um, much of the data that's come out in the imaging world has been uh, pretty mundane. I would say we're in a major dull tone. But I think these data are really quite provocative in several ways. Uh, one is that this group, uh, which is Lloyd's group, um, have really come up with uh, an interesting concept of lifetime risk, which by the way is controversial. Uh, there's a lot of argument of, you know, what are the cut points, just like with everything else. Um, but using his, his, uh, his cut points and his definitions, you can see that uh, very nicely that from the low short-term risk, and the Framingham less than 10%, to, to a low lifetime risk, which he defines as less than 39%, all the way up to the high short-term risk, which is greater than 20%, you can see a nice uh, pattern in, in IMT. And this is true for men, it's true for women, and it's true in cardia, and it's true in MESA. And all these individuals uh, who were included in this analysis were less than 50, 50 years old. You can see there's differences in IMTs between the two studies, and uh, this uh, much reflects probably the differences in how the images were acquired and, and analyzed, which again is, uh, is, is a major, major technical and methodological issue uh, when, when we discuss IMT. It's not as simple uh, and uniform as is doing CAC or, or coronary and 
geography invasively or even non-invasively. That was not mean IMT? Yes. No fires. Uh, it's, well, depends what you mean by plaque. It's, it's, it's the Cardian Mesa protocol, so it includes multiple segments. But if, you, if your IMT you know, continuous uh, measurement is less than, say, 0.7, and then you have one spot that is 1.2, but that does not, did not cut this category. That's right. They didn't classify plaque as one category by itself. No, not plaque itself. Because at that time, there was no. It's a combination of the ma measure. maximum across, you know, it's the, it's the mean maximum across the number of segments that they included in their analyses. So you, you can have a, a thickening that could be 1.1, 1.2, and then that would be averaged with, let's say, the rest of the segments, which could be 0.6. Right. That's, that's, the, that's the methodology. And that's the It mean. tends to homogenize it, whereas if you define plaque as one <coughs> category itself, and wherever you find that category uh, uh, met, then you will have probably, it would exaggerate results that they found, or even increase the predicted value of life. It potentially could. So, uh, I debated including these because I didn't know if it really had much relevance to the guidelines, but it sounds like it's maybe an evolving concept you all thinking about. So about 20 years ago, American Heart ATB scientific session at the Duff Memorial, one of the concepts that, that we presented was this idea of multiple vascular beds to be utilized in, in screening. Um, and I, I apologize for this. I, I brought the paper because I couldn't get the Venn diagram to come up on the screen. But uh, this is a group of individuals. Um, 45 and older, older, asymptomatic individuals, um, over 500 of them. And just to give you a, without going through all the numbers, uh, if you can imagine a Venn diagram of CAC and aortic calcium and CIMT, we define calcium presence as greater than zero and CIMT greater than 75th percentile. And again, you need to also keep in mind that these percentiles that we establish for CIMT are, are really quite uh, random. There's no real good evidence to support where we make cut points. I noticed in the shape you guys use 50 percentile. Um, in fact, only 13.7% of the cohort had atherosclerosis in all three segments. Uh, the greatest, as you would expect, because as we all know, atherosclerosis is an ascending uh, aging process in upright primates. 25% uh, of the population had aortic calcium. Only 5% had coronary calcium. And only 2% had CIMT, uh, radio syndicate percentile. So if you're to you know, choose one measurement over another, uh, let's say you all follow PK's suggestion. Well, it really wasn't a suggestion. I think everybody jumped on him inappropriately. Um, but let's say he did make the suggestion. In this population, which is really quite representative of Los Angeles County, both in risk factor for asymptomatic individuals and uh, its genetics and in its ethnic makeup, um, if you did IMT first, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to miss you're going to get 2% of the population, but the other 5% are only going to have CAC, and 25% are only going to have aortic calcium. So you're going to miss uh, even an earlier precursor to coronary disease, which we all know uh, really occurs down in the aortic area. Interestingly, only 23% um, had both uh, a positive coronary artery calcium scan and uh, aortic calcium. So a lot of this is driven by the ascending nature of the atherosclerotic process, 
It's driven by the genetics as we're learning, and it's driven by the risk factors that impact each segment differentially. So the first thing we did was to look and see if there was a relationship between Framingham risk score and uh, number of segments involved. And as you can see, there's a very nice, highly significant trend. Now, clearly we're not the first group to do this. Um, Colors group has done some very interesting things, uh, looking at EKGs and IMT and CAP together, uh, using ABIs and, and putting all these uh, other measures together also. And it does appear, when you look at the literature, the sense is uh, the more, just, just like risk factors, you know, to a point, the more you do, the greater your predictability. In fact, Lloyd was the group in the New Journal a couple years back who showed that uh, we've basically reached our point of saturation and how many biomarkers we can or should be measuring. And that's probably true for imaging also. So this is looking across the actual risk um, categories. And as you'd expect, as the high risk uh, category in Framingham, expect um, to see uh, the greater number of vessels involved and the least um, in terms of involvement. And again, the trends are, are significant in, in both directions. So the number, the number of segments uh, clearly um, uh, helps in, or at least uh, is, is, can be defined by the different training and risk categories. And I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any comments or questions for Dr. Hodes? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. No, this is this is a low risk group. Um, uh, you know, we we uh, we for many years our group focused on the disease population with all the coronary angiography studies and femoral studies initiated. Um, and um, probably, I don't know, early 90s, we took a different direction, realizing that, you know, that story's done. We know what to do with those individuals. So all our studies uh, over the last almost 20 years have been focused in low-risk uh, individuals. And here in Framingham, risk over this group um, substantiates that. So these are all low-risk uh, uh, subjects at recruitment. There's some spectrum to the framing again, but it's going to be skewed to the lower number. Any other questions? In the progression that you should show, what can we rely on in terms of the value? You showed one of your slides at point oh one. Like 0.01 millimeter is like 10 micron per year. Per year, can yeah. we measure? Well, within individuals. Yeah. Why not? Does that mean? My understanding of ultrasound special resolution is the best. You can go to 20, 30, 40 micron certain things that fit the size of your hand. Yeah. Right. But traditional is 100 micron. Yeah, you have you asked a good question. I, I think this is an area that creates a lot of confusion. Um, detectability in any measure, okay, uh, does not rely on, on change, does not rely on detectability. It's just that simple. So what you're measuring is, is individual measures over time and looking at that change over time. You're not looking at a distance in an individual and saying that's change. You're looking at single measures over time. So it's like, real simply, real simply, let's just, what everybody understands, cholesterol measures, okay? And let's just, and let's just assume that you're in a lab where the detectability is two milligrams per deciliter, okay? Can you not measure a change of one milligram per deciliter from year one to year two? If my measurement block, let's say this block is 0 0.5, 0 0.05 or 50 micron or 0 0.100 micron, 
the only thing that I can see is one more block. I can't see one and a half block because the measurement is one block. It's like but you're thinking you're thinking of this as looking at a distance within within uh, a measure, and that's not what you're looking at. You're looking at two distinct measures over time. So in my example, the cholesterol measure, you may be five milligrams per deciliter at time okay, one, and saying. you may be 4.5 at time two, okay, so you have a difference of 0.5. You're not mean. looking at, you're not looking at, you're not looking at focal resolution, you're not looking at detectability limits when you're looking at change. I wish we had a slide now, for that to, to explain that, but I think what you're saying is that next time they come in, we're not necessarily comparing with the previous time. This is one measurement itself, and within that measurement, you will stay in whatever range of measurement you're doing. But if we're looking at progression and regression of the same individual, I just have a hard time to understand changes that are within the noise level of measurements. That's Depends what you mean by noise level. level. But these were the these were the same arguments made about quantitative coronary angiography 30 years ago. Right. So let's and see. and I think that we've all learned that clearly we can measure change. We know that coronary change is highly predictably advanced. Blah blah blah. The bottom line is the bottom line is that detectability has nothing to do with your ability to detect change because you're not measuring this. You're not measuring the distance of a single individual. You're just you're, you're saying you're not measuring the, different numbers over time. You're saying you're not measuring the change. You're measuring a new value. Therefore, the new value is 0.75. It's not the new value is not 0.05 or 0 0.0. Is that what you're saying? You're not measuring delta. You're measuring the absolute value. That's what you're saying. Each time you're measuring the absolute value. Each time exactly. you're measuring the absolute exactly. value. If you were to measure the delta, you would be within. Is that what you're saying? Well, you can't. You're, 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 in, every, in every imaging technology, you're limited by focal resolution, period. Right? right. And in, in image processing, if you're using automated That's techniques, yeah. you're, you're limited by pixel yeah. and, in some cases, sub-pixel interpolation. Image processing is much easier. It's much easier. You can go to one micron and so on. But image acquisition. We're limited by the block of measurement and ultrasound wavelength, and that's where it is. So I mean, the, bo the bottom line is, okay. the bottom line is, that unless you get down into five, six, seven-year-olds, you're not going to be worried about not being able to measure the IMT. They're the ones that sometimes you see 200 micron thicknesses. Yeah, you're not going to be able to measure that. Once they pop over 300, you're going to measure that. Ready to go to the uh, next presentation. Uh, how is this?